Welcome to Cloudscaly Podcast episode. We have Matthew, and I will let Matthew introduce himself for the audience. So, uh, my name is Matt McKeever. I'm the Chief Information Security Officer and Head of Cloud Engineering at LexisNexis. That's a very interesting role. You have security and engineering under the same wing. Yeah, it's a great combination. A lot of work, a lot of efforts, a lot of overlapping priorities sometimes. But in the end, I have really two solid teams under me that help support in the cloud engineering and the security side. And we a lot of collaboration across the business stakeholders as well. That's awesome. And I think it'll be interesting to hear your perspective on how the two merge together. Now, specifically, we're talking about Gen AI and obviously how you guys have been using it. Could you share about the use case that obviously has mentioned the AWS reInvent keynote? Uh, what, let's just start with what's the use case. We've been using AI for, for many years in our product. We have petabytes of data and our customers use this for search engines, basically search our products. We do other practical guidance, help them kind of draft certain documents. With Gen AI, with Introduce that now we have a much more robust search engine. We can do searching, we can do drafting of legal arguments, legal briefs, legal consent decrees. We can do summarization of our cases. We have many cases and you want to summarize a case, we can give you the summarization of that case. And then you can actually upload your document and we can summarize your document for you. And then ask general questions on that and you can roll that up many times across a couple of times. All with Gen AI. And the trigger behind all that is we have our own anthropic legally trained model that we trained ourselves. Oh, wow. So we use that as one of our bedrock, no pun intended, <laughs> with AWS bedrock to actually leverage that. Awesome. And how was this done before this? Because I imagine all the paralegals or at least CISOs in a legal firm, they're listening to this going, isn't that like a paralegal job? Is this more like how Gen AI can be used to do a paralegal's job or is that a bit more than that? I think it's more about efficiency. It's an efficient play at, at their firm so they can actually do more. Yeah. You know, maybe that maybe that associate can now get better research that they they hand off to the associate and, and or to the partner. But it's more, it's more an efficient play. They can look across everything because even we give them, you know, the summarization of a case, we still give them all the links to that case. Um, on a search, we still give them all the links to it. They can go and verify it. Yeah. Um, but basically, it's, it's going to uh, expedite the, the, the use cases. For awesome. Them. The only reason I thought that is because I was thinking, I've been watching this show called uh, Suits on, I, I, I'm like, and I think I remember seeing this, where the entire episode is based on someone just going through documents, mountains of documents, trying to figure out which legal, I won't say a loophole on this podcast, but I'll just say what legal way you can have used so that you can bring a client outside safely or win. Like, it's just one of those ones where instead of spending an entire episode, they could just literally have one query and that could be solved, right? Yeah, it's been that way for a while though, but yes, this makes it even more important, yeah. Oh, awesome, and I, I think I want to talk about your journey because obviously the work that you guys have been doing has been mentioned in Keynote by Entropic as well. In terms of how this came into being, what are some of the services that you're using in the background from Amazon that you can talk about? Yeah, we've been at Amazon for, for many years. We've been using Amazon for a while. A lot of their services are, are ingrained in our environment. More recently, been using Bedrock and their Bedrock instances. Yep. And we use a couple of different models. We use the different cloud models that they have available. And really, the key thing is to our data science team and the cloud engineering team is which model should we use for which service? And there's a cost difference between the different models. There's a speed difference and... So we've been using Bedrock since it came out, probably right before it came out, and other AWS services, a plethora of them. Yeah. I, I, we just, whatever is, is right for the job. Oh, awesome. And would you say, in terms of building your own model, does the threat level change? Because a lot of the conversations that I have with CISOs around Gen AI, or I'll start with the whole very first chat GPT that changed a lot of people's lives last November. A lot of conversations that I'm having with CISOs is around the fact that I can't trust this, I need to have a proxy, or some way of just managing what's being sent out. Has that changed the threat level that you guys had before now that you're more into Gen AI and using your own models? Good question. I don't think it's changed a whole bunch. For the main purpose of, we were using AI before in a mm. closed system. So when we're using Bedrock, it's still a closed system. We've trained the model ourselves. Our customer queries, our customer usage of it doesn't change the model. So it's still our model. Yep. It's still our content. And then, it go, and then it goes against our content. So it's all a closed loop system really tight security around that. Whatever the customer types in, there's some prompt engineer that does some filtering on it before it goes to the large language model and then it comes back again, queries against our content. There's a famous case in New York where a lawyer submitted a fake case yep. and the case actually didn't exist. It'll never happen in our system because we're going against our content that we've had for many years. Oh, also if you were to, and I think it's really interesting as well, you know how, again, I'm gonna go, there's so much reference to legal things in TV shows and otherwise as well. If someone mentions a case, I don't know, some case from the past, which is not an actual case, it shouldn't really matter because you're just looking at your internal data instead of looking at, hey, what's on the internet about this? So Joe right. Blow decided to put a, a fake case on the internet. That would not be getting picked up over here. 
Correct. Will be picked up. And actually, we, we go one level further, but we'll shepherdize, as we call it. So even if a case was overruled, yeah. we'll bring that back to as well. This is, oh, that's bad case law. That's been overruled. Yeah. So again, we've been doing that for many years. Gen AI just makes it a little more efficient and you can better search results. So I, I think this is very interesting because your role is both security and engineering. I find that really fascinating from a people process technology perspective as well, because I believe, at least on Cloud Security Podcast, we have a lot of security audience who's probably trying to get geared up with how do I react to Gen AI? How do I start using building my own LLMs, how do I secure my LLMs? In terms of how you guys went about thinking from a talent perspective, I don't even know where do you, where do you even start like this process of, oh, today we're going to be a Gen AI company for, I don't know, for months to come or whatever. How would someone start? What are some of the challenges or what are some of the things you would consider or you would ask them to consider as you go through this? Because you guys have been doing this for some time already. Yes, yeah, so we've been doing it for a while. From an infrastructure perspective, my, my role is very different. I was the CISO from, for much longer than I had been cloud engineering, but I grew up as an infrastructure guy. So it was always infrastructure security. Oh, okay. And, and then a, a year or so ago, we made some changes and, and I have both. With two strong teams under me, that helps me a lot. But really making sure that they collaborate before there was a lot of the collaboration could have been better. So I'm like, of that collaboration. From a security perspective, you look at Gen AI, like any other new technology you use, what are the threats, what are the risks, what do you see, it, right? In our case, it's following the data, following our customers' data. Our customer queries are, are very confidential, right? So what a lawyer is searching on, obviously, is very confidential. They don't want that leaked out. So really following that through, and then our data coming back, we'll be giving back to that. It's all closed and loop. It's all segmented out so we know what's talking to what, and that's key. But I think there's standard building blocks mm. in security, right? It's, it's authentication. It's encryption. It's the right architecture. Who's accessing what? How is that data flowing? So really, it's the same building blocks, the basic security building blocks going forward. And in terms of building a team around this, because I, I don't know how many people are even experienced in this thing that's been, I, I, I imagine it's a lot more learning as you go as well. What was the thing that you found that worked to balance the risk between experience versus, this is like a number one challenge for a lot of companies. I, I want to be creative, I want to be innovative, but at the same time, I want to be secure as well. Is there some work from a balanced perspective? In, in our world, we have, all these data science and data engineers who have all these great ideas. When security is be all, we always want to say no or, or, or restricted. But we never really say no. It's like we, now we work with them. We develop a really strong collaboration and we work with those teams from the beginning. Yep. So right now, at the very beginning, we're going to do Gen AI, this chat GPT, and we, we're worried about hallucinations. Where's our data going? What's yeah. going outside? Yeah. And we work with the architecture collaboratively. So, all right, because we're all learning together, right? Make it closed end. And then we're worried about people poisoning our prompts or sending poison prompts in, but we have another filter in front of that. Yeah. So whatever comes in, we're actually filtering that out. Yeah. Say, hey, whatever's going into our system, we know what's going into our system. Yeah. It's, again, the principle of check your inputs on programming, it's not much different, right? It's really those basic building blocks. Yeah. And really got to break it down and then understand the risk. There are a couple other unique risks in there. You have to watch through what's your model, how's yeah. your model doing, yeah. who has access to your model, are you in a closed-end system? And that's where I think Bedrock does that for us. Bedrock, it's closed-end. It's not going outside. It's all in our endpoint. Only us, we can talk to our endpoint based on the private endpoints we have and how AWS is, is configured. We've configured our environment. I think maybe what's worthwhile calling out... Uh, could you share what were some of the business reasons to go into the Gen AI space? I think I would imagine as a field to what you said before, it used to take hours and there's a lot of, is there more productivity? What led you guys going down the Gen AI path for your business? We've been cutting edge, not cutting edge from a technology perspective. So our data science teams were always looking at new models, new AI models. And back in a year ago, they, when it, they got wind of it, they started playing around, they started thinking about it, this could work. And then January, February, March, we started getting a lot more momentum going from a business perspective for a data company. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a game changer from a data company. And from a business perspective, we said this will be a game changer. Yeah. Um, so lots of resources applied to it, validating, you know, working through customer feedback. Um, and then, you know, product comes out. We still get customer feedback on that product. We're still looking to improve it. One of the things that I wanted to cover as part of this conversation was also the changing security landscape and working with Gen AI Spade, but also one of the things that were called out at the keynote was the shortage of talent in general in cloud. There's also themes around the fact that people should have a data security strategy of some sort. Is there any advice for people who probably are already, and I don't know if this is something that you guys face, where a lot of data is already unstructured. There's a lot of data which is unlabeled. There's data that's just basically data sprawl is a real thing, as one would imagine. For people who are looking at that now, and in terms of if you put your engineering hat instead of this, oh, well, I guess you can put engineering as security hat, what was something that was a challenge that you had to overcome that you would pass on as an advice to the people, hey, don't do this, 
because it totally just doesn't work. From a product side, we're, we had it pretty covered. It's done the internal use, our enterprise use, how our internal employees are, want to use ChatGPT. Oh, right. That's always a risk. So we did a lot of education. We didn't lock it down, but a lot of education of people how to use it, when not to use it. We really basically don't use it for anything with our customer data, our business data, any internal data, a lot of education. Because if you try to lock it down, I, I think you just, you're going to create more problems. It's going to yep. get out. And now you can, people are going to, I'm going to try and break out, right? A lot of education, continued education around that. And actually, we've actually opened up, a, we're piloting it now, but an internal chat GPT that, again, it's a closed-end model also. Oh. So you can start using how to do a marketing campaign against something or how do I do something. So there's use cases where you can actually just use an internal, same bedrock connections, yeah. uh, internal use of it. Yeah, um, we do a lot of Office 365 for on the on the enterprise side, but really giving people those closed end solutions that yeah. they can use our data, whether it's customer day, whether it's your email, whether meeting minutes. How do I summarize? How do I change my code? Whether it's code whisper, you got to give them like happy path, <laughs> yes. the right way forward. Because if you don't give them a happy path, they're gonna find a path. They will find their own path. So really tell them make the safe path easy for them, and and so that's what we're doing. We're having like I said, this internal proxy we're using. Like ChatGPT. So Cloud Security Podcast has security folks in the audience as well. And there's not a lot of people talking about the use of custom LLM models that they've created themselves and how they have been able to successfully do it in a product as well. In terms of skills that would be required in a team and specifically in a cloud security team, for lack of a better word, because of the Cloud Security Podcast, how different would it be? Because you have been, to what you called out, you have been using AWS for a long time. Has the role of that team dramatically changed? Apart from, hey, it's a new service that I'm trying to protect. Has that dramatically changed from pre-custom LLM to now that you guys are using your own LLM models? Yeah. The one thing that we didn't quite understand and we learned quickly is capacity planning and cost modeling of it. Oh. Because it's easy to set up. Infrastructure-wise, you point at endpoint. You're done. Use it. Yeah, use okay. It. But within Bedrock, there's token-based pricing, which is a paper token, but it may not be guaranteed. So if you may hit a, a spike, you may have to peel off and, and, and retries. In an online transaction search business, between nine and five, it's yeah. peak US, yeah. right? that's a world peak. We, we can't risk our customer not being down. So we have to buy capacity. extra. Yeah. yeah. So th there's a, a provision model. So really now managing your, the traffic across that. Yeah. So it's more capacity planning, very similar to how we do our cloud-based costs. Like I have a cloud business office, mm -hmm. and they look at all the financial models and at how we make sure we're getting the right price out of it, our usage, and what we're paying. And now with this becomes now what should be token-based, what should not be token-based. Oh. And it's really, uh, we have our finance guys involved also. <laughs> What's the financial model? As we're using more capacity, as we're growing, yeah. our usage is growing, when do you increase more models? Do you increase more models? Do you use a different model on token-based? And really the the calculus of that becomes rather interesting. Wow. I, I didn't even think about, because to what you said, now that I think about this, chat GPT and other people, they talk about, oh, we have this token limit. That's why they talk about that. That's where there's a chat GPT talks about the fact that it's a huge cost to run every single query. It's because that token, like the amount right. of compute required per token. Right. So your, your tokens in and tokens out, but you can go to provision model yeah. that, that, that Amazon has and, and, and Bedrock that has a, a, a certain peak tokens per minute. Oh, okay. So that's your peak per minute. Yeah. So you gotta plan for the peak. Oh, it's not like you could have one of those instants for five minutes and then you're done, but it's more uh, like you're planning ahead for it. Yeah, it's early days. It'd be interesting to see where Amazon comes. Yeah, uh, yeah, for sure. But we're, everyone's trying to push that. Like, I, I only want eight, I want nine to five, I'll want a lot. And then yeah, yeah. Minutes. And I think oh, it's worth calling out because this is not like it's been there for years, right? right? We're all like at this point, almost like a new frontier for the better word, yeah. where now we're all trying to figure out what's the best way to approach it as more business use cases keep coming in. Uh, I think everyone will start improving. So I think it's really good to at least see that, oh, I think the fact that from a skill set perspective is more around, I, I guess, so would you say the threat landscape didn't really dramatically change because it was more data focused, but with the cloud security roles in terms of the monitoring and any any of those, you didn't see that dramatic change. It was primarily around that. Not, not a dramatic change. Like I said, it's it's security architecture that hasn't changed in, in a whole bunch of years. Okay. You know, validating that we're using a private endpoint. We're not going out to open AI public, right? We don't make sure we're closed end. Again, basic blocking and tackling from a security perspective, the data engineering, obviously, completely different. And then I said the cost-based aspect of things. My team has the AWS cost management, right? We work with a finance team. But how do we manage that? Are we using it? When should we go up? When should we go down? When should we, can we move some workloads to off hours? So we yeah, can, you know, yeah. Some, some certain workloads, nights and weekends that we don't have to do during the day. And, yeah. and just use that capacity you already have to be as efficient as possible. Awesome. I think I've got one more question and that's towards the tail end of this now. So any CISO or CTO who's listening to this conversation, 
and probably is working on a custom LLM of some sort. What's a good starting point for them to start working on something like this? And they might be like what you said, they bought away in cloud for a long time. And what would you say would be a good starting point from a maturity perspective? Hey, this is a good starting point. And this is the next milestone after that you work towards. I think it's define your use case. It's a new tool in your toolbox, right? Mm -hmm. Because you have a hammer, not everything's just cool. (laughs) But really look at your use case and really balance out which model you need. They're all different pricing. They're all different capacity. Which do you need? It's probably a mix of them. And then continue to grow and don't be afraid to adjust and pivot because it's ever changing. It is a new technology, new frontier, maybe for some, for us, it's just a new technology that's going to take off. Really just be agile in your approach. And don't be afraid to back off and do something different. Interesting. Uh, definitely go agile, I would definitely say. I think uh, it's one of those ones where, uh, actually, I've got a fun question for you later on. So this was the, most of the technical questions I have. I've got three fun questions for you, not technical related, just to get to All know right. you a bit more. First one being, what do you spend most time on when you're not working on technology or cloud or security or engineering? There's not a whole bunch of that time. <laughs> um, really just vegging. I've taken up golf recently, so try a little you know, golf here and there. We just vegging, just go in restaurants, a foodie, whether it's in the summertime, beach. Okay to show you a handicap level. What's the handicap level? Uh, I don't keep a handicap. It's <laughs> not quite there yet. So. Yeah, oh, fair enough. As long as the ball goes in, I don't really. Uh, two digits. I'm below 100, but I don't really keep a handicap. Uh, I'm more of a mini golf person. I'm just trying one of those little lane ways as well. Second question, what is something that you're proud of, but that is not on your social media? Proud of not on my social media. I think on the personal side, my, I got two kids who are really successful. My daughter is down in Miami doing some marketing stuff that she never thought she'd doing and she's really doing good. And my son's an actuary, which I never thought he'd be an oh, actuary wow. because he was one of those kids who didn't stay in high school and just really took off. So really proud from where they took off. I'll make sure this is this is shared with your kids so that you get some of your brownie points. Yeah, <laughs> uh, last one, what is uh, your favorite cuisine or restaurant that you can share? Thai food. Thai food? Number one, oh, awesome. Uh, I'm gonna add a fourth question because it wasn't there it been the beginning. What, since you've been in the space for a long time, and you've come from the infra- infrastructure space like myself, what is something that you miss about the waterfall days? I really miss the pace. It was so much more laid back, it's gonna come, time. Now it's, you gotta, it's constant, I mean, it's changing, it's going, it was just interesting. You're never really bored, but it seems, I, I told someone like, I'm busier today than I was yesterday, and that's been going on for a while. Yeah. But it's interesting, I think we're just changing so fast and be able to change, because back in the waterfall days, it, maybe it was set and forget it, there's your path, and. Oh, it didn't work out and it didn't matter. So. Yeah. <laughs> no, so. thank you for sharing that. That was definitely something I'm going to keep remembering that one, though. I appreciate that. Thank you so yeah. much. For people who want to know more about, hey, I'm building an LM model. I want to know what security engineering looks like. Where can people reach out to you? I'm on LinkedIn. Okay. I'll put that in the show notes as well. Thank you so much Excellent. for coming on the show. Excellent. Thank you very much. I appreciate Thanks. it. No problem. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. See you in the next Bye. episode. Peace.